Hello, welcome to this presentation. My name is Pietro Gambardella, and I will uh, talk today about the coupling of nanomagnets enabled by the chalusinski moria interaction. Before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers of TMEG for putting together such an interesting program, as well as for managing the transition from an in-presence to an online conference. I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions of uh, the people who made this work possible, in particular, Jan Afci, Charles-Henri Lambert, Jacques Mossala, and Fong Tao from ETH Zurich, and our collaborators from uh, the Paul Scherer Institute, the group of Lara Heidermann, in particular, Cao Chu Luo and Alish Trabek. So uh, the subject of magnetic coupling is a very interesting one, both because these couplings uh, essentially tell us something about fundamental magnetic and electronic interactions that happen inside different material systems, but also because uh, by coupling nanomagnets together, we can uh, change their properties and uh, also uh, exploit them in devices. So we have uh, here some of the most famous types of couplings, dipolar couplings, which works with, uh, between stacked magnets as well as um, as well as uh, magnets that are on the same uh, plane. We have exchange bias, arc like Y coupling between uh, layers that are deposited on top to each other, either a ferromagnetic contact with an antiferromagnet or two magnets separated by non-magnetic spacers. And recently also we have uh, this uh, chalazinski moria coupling that has become or is becoming more and more prominent and this is where uh, the coupling I'm going to focus on in the main part of this talk. So now if we think in terms of uh, couplings that are mediated by conduction electrons, uh, these are the RKKY and uh, DMI interactions and these are particularly interesting and have been studied also for quite a while, especially in the context, for example, of spin glasses or dilute magnetic alloys. And here it is known that if uh, one has two magnetic moments, two local moments, for example, belonging to two transition metal atoms uh, that are uh, hosted by a, a non-magnetic metal with a conduction electron C, then the uh, SD exchange interaction between the conduction electrons and the local uh, spins uh, mediates a, a coupling between these two spins that can be either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic in nature. And this depends on the, uh, essentially on the distance and on the Fermi wavelength of the uh, host material. And this is the famous RKKY coupling, which is isotropic in the sense that it does not depend particularly on the orientation of the two spins with respect to a, a symmetry axis. On the other hand, if we add uh, spin orbit coupling into such a model, for example, by including a non-magnetic atom with uh, strong local spin orbit coupling, uh, this will on one hand uh, change the the uh, hybridization of the wave functions in this system and will also introduce symmetry breaking, making it possible for a jaluzinski moria type of interaction to appear. And this is what uh, is uh, well represented in this famous uh, three-site model of Ferret and Levy. And uh, we see that here also we have a coupling that can be oscillatory in nature and that uh, differently from the uh, RKKY coupling, this coupling favors orthogonal alignment between uh, the two spins here. And what is very interesting to remark is that these two couplings do not exclude each other. In fact, in general, they coexist as long as these uh, conditions are fulfilled. And uh, based on, on the model of Firth and Levy, one expects also that the, the, the uh, DMI coupling relative to the RKKY interaction is about uh, factor 10 smaller. 
So uh, this is what we know from this uh, sort of dilute uh, magnetic system models. Now the arctic ay coupling has been uh, widely studied in uh, multilayer systems, uh, where it is called interlayer arctic ay coupling because it enables the, the coupling of two different layers separated by a non-magnetic spacer. And uh, for example, uh, Stuart Parking has studied in detail such systems showing that different spacers uh, promote couplings of different strengths and also that this coupling uh, oscillates from ferromagnetic to antiferromagnetic with the spacer thickness here. This is also well understood in theory uh, as being a, a essentially a consequence of uh, this SD exchange combined with the confinement of the electronic wave functions in the um, non-magnetic metal spacer that in this confinement depends on the relative orientation of the magnetization of the two layers. So um, if you're interested, you can read this references to, to know more about this. What is also known is that in, in real material, for example, by including roughness effects, uh, these couplings tend to de decrease and these uh, periodic oscillations also smear out quicker than in the ideal case. Okay. Typical arctic ay coupling strengths are the order of a, a millijoule per meter square. And so this is a, a good number to keep into account. Now, uh, there have been recently proposals to uh, merge uh, RKKY coupling and jaluzinski mori interaction in order to couple two uh, separate magnetic layers in a way that is not only a collinear one as promoted by RKKY coupling, but also introducing DMI in this system. And so uh, here we have two experimental realizations of this idea one from uh, Fernando Pacheco and colleagues, and another one from Han and, and colleagues in Mainz. And uh, here, uh, the main point is that we have two ferromagnetic layers. Generally, we have uh, a rather strong uh, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, uh, which is induced by platinum. And platinum also serves to induce interfacial DMI in, uh, in each uh, magnetic layer. Separately. And then uh, the uh, retinium spacer promotes RKKY coupling between these two magnetizations. So this has been shown to affect the uh, collective magnetic behavior of these multilayers uh, um, due essentially to, to the canting uh, promoted by the DMI in this system so that the magnetizations are not collinear anymore, parallel and parallel, but there is a canting angle. And this canting angle then uh, affects the magnetization reversal, especially if you combine an out of plane field, as, as is plotted here, with an in plane field uh, that either favors or uh, inhibits the DMI preferred direction. But in general, this interlayer DMI coupling can also occur between two ferromagnetic layers separated by a single spacer. So you don't need a, a ruthenium spacer to promote uh, RKKY coupling between the two layers. And this has been uh, shown theoretically uh, early on by KXIA et al. In, back in 97. And then there is a more recent work by Benedenko and uh, Berger uh, who uh, analyze in detail a situation that is very interesting for, for interlayer couplings where you have two magnetic layers. Here, these are the blue atoms separated by no magnetic layer. These are the, the, the gray atoms. And now here the situation is a lot more complex than in the three-site model of, of Perth and Level because there are many different three sides. There are many different ways in which two magnetic atoms can couple through the non-magnetic atoms in the spacer, just because this is a more extended system. And so one can define an effective DMI coupling constant here, uh, summing over all possible um, non-magnetic atoms, this, this AB 
sum here. And then one can uh, sum over all the atoms in the ferromagnetic layer, A and B, uh, to uh, calculate the effective DMI coupling in the system. Now, uh, in general, if the two layers have collinear magnetizations, then this, this term here can uh, basically be grouped out of the summation. And so one is left with this sum of effective DMI constants. Turns out that for a perfect HCP or FCC stacked system, this sum averages to zero because uh, one has uh, a sum of DMI vectors that cancel out with respect to each other. However, any deviation from a, a perfect HCP or FCC stacking, uh, including those due to, to different interfaces, different materials in the A and B layers, as well as disorder, may uh, will induce a, a non-zero effective DMI coupling. And this has also been calculated in this sort of ideal system where the distance between the, the spacer layer atoms and the two ferromagnetic layers has been offset from the middle. And, and this is a, a plot that shows the effective DMI constant as a function of the uh, overall distance between um, these two layers. So, uh, now what we did in our group was to uh, try to um, you know, evidence this coupling mediated by a single spacer. And for that, we thought that the most convenient uh, situation would be one in which the magnetizations in the two ferromagnetic layers would not be collinear to each other, but rather orthogonal to each other. Because as you can see from this uh, simplified DMI Hamiltonian, this is, the situation in which the uh, DMI energy will be larger. And also because this is the situation in which other couplings, collinear couplings, would be smaller, ideally zero, right? All the collinear types of couplings, including RKKY, but also proximity mediated effects, are expected to be zero in the ideal case where the two magnetizations point at 90 degrees with, each other, with respect to each other. So we wonder whether in such a system, the interlayer DMI interaction can uh, favor, for example, one chirality, where the chirality here is defined by the sense of rotation going from the bottom layer to the top layer, as you see here, um, or, uh, or the other one, right? Depending on the sign of the DMI interactions in the system. And so uh, to, uh, investigate then this type of systems, we prepared, this is the work of Jan Avci, Charlene Louis Lambert and, and Giacomo Sala, we, we prepared a stack made of a perpendicular uh, layer. This perpendicular layer is essentially a terbium iron, eight nanometer thick alloy, which is uh, dusted with a very thin layer of cobalt, which is supposed to, to promote the uh, indirect electronic interactions with the top layer, which is a, a, a cobalt layer within plane magnetization. And we just have a thin platinum spacer in the middle, and we can vary the thickness of this space. And our samples are, are then patterned as whole bars. We can measure the whole effect, particularly the anomalous whole effect, uh, as well as the longitudinal magnetic resistance. And here you see a plot of the uh, anomalous hole effect as a function of out of plane magnetic field. And this plot uh, contains two parts. One is a, is a rather square hysteresis loop here. And uh, the other one is a rather linear increase of the magnetization up to saturation, which we associate with the magnetization of the cobalt layer that is, tends to stay in plane and is then rotated out of plane by the uh, applied field. Okay. And these are two schematic um, separations of the two contributions that we extracted from, from such a plot. 
Okay, so we have a system with perpendicular magnetizations. Now the next step is to see whether we can actually evidence uh, some chiral coupling in the system. So one way to do this is to uh, apply a field that is uh, not really out of plane, but tilted at an angle. And if you look at this picture, you, you will realize that, uh, for example, in this case here, this, uh, so changing the field from, uh, say, up to down along this axis will favor uh, either the black or the um, gray magnetic configurations, and this belong to the same chirality. And if we tilt the field in the opposite direction, then we'll favor two uh, orientations with opposite chirality. Okay. Not sure I put the, the arrows correctly here, but that's what this is supposed to do. So, uh, and then we measure the uh, anomalous hole effect in this system, which is basically the projection of the out of plane uh, magnetization in particular. You know, this is looking at the bottom terbium iron layer. What we see is that these two loops are not uh, the same for the two opposite tilts. One has a smaller cursivity, one has a higher cursivity. And it turns out that the smaller cursivity one is the uh, what we would expect if we go from a DMI favored alignment between the top and sorry, the bottom and top layer to another DMI favored alignment between the two layers. This results in a smaller cursivity. Whereas if we go from an unfavored situation to, a, to an unfavored situation, we expect a higher cursivity basically because an intermediate state would have the favored DMI orientation and therefore would be harder to switch. And this reasoning is also supported by macrospin uh, simulations of this. So we can conclude from this type of uh, measurements that indeed there seems to be uh, an interaction in between the two layers that favors a certain uh, chiral orientation of the magnetizations in the two layers. And what we can also do is uh, then change the in-plane projection of the applied field. So we perform the same measurements with a tilt at plus or minus 15 degrees with respect to the out of plane direction, but we change the in-plane projection of the field and, and rotate the field over the azimuthal angle, as you see in this sketch. And then we measure this difference in coercivity between the, the two opposite tilts. And what we see is that this difference coercivity follows a sine behavior. And uh, then, uh, if we think about this, this is exactly what we would expect if this coupling uh, between the two layers is promoted by uh, a Jaluzinski interaction with a t-vector at a certain orientation in the plane. So in-plane orientation of the d-vector is what we would expect based on general symmetry argument. Uh, we do not have a specific symmetry in the system to fix the in-plane direction of, of the D vector. And indeed, we find that in different devices, in different systems, this uh, the, the D vector is always in plane, but its orientation with respect to, for example, our current direction changes. Okay. So in this particular sample, we find that uh, the D vector is essentially oriented uh, along this direction that I I'll point with a, with a pointer here. And uh, here I remark that the D cross Z direction is the one that is actually favored by the, uh, this is the effective DMI field direction. So uh, by fitting this, this curve, we can extract also the value of the effective DMI field, which turns out to be quite remarkable. So we have eight millitesla of this effective field coupling the top and bottom layer. Now, if we think of the symmetry of this effect, we'll see that it is compatible with this uh, DMI type of interaction, but it's not compatible with either proximity coupling or RKKY coupling, which would tend to favor collinear orientations of the magnetizations in the, in the top and bottom layer. And it's also not compatible 
with the uh, so-called uh, B quadratic coupling, that is a higher order in their coupling terms that can favor uh, orthogonal magnetization alignment, but not with a uh, sinus behavior. So we think we really have evidence for, for DMI interlayer coupling mediated by a single platinum spacer. And uh, here we have looked at the effect of this coupling on the out of plane magnetic layer, but we can also perform a magneto resistance measurement and look at the effect of the effective DMI field on the in plane magnetic layer. So here the idea is that we uh, switch the magnetization of the top layer with an in plane field uh, as the magnetization of the bottom layer stays fixed because the in-plane field is not strong enough to uh, considerably tilt or let alone switch this magnetization. And what we observe uh, if we perform typical uh, sweeps of the in-plane field recording the resistance, we see a, a magnetic resistance that has a, a peak as the uh, magnetization switches. Essentially, this type of broad peaks are known to occur when the magnetization disorders into a, a multi domain pattern. And so, we can tell that uh, this, this peak position essentially tells us when one layer is switching. And we see that uh, the uh, field at which the layer, the top layer switches, depends on the magnetic orientation of the bottom layer, either up or down. And so again, this, this shift in the switching field is actually a measure of the effective DMI field, uh, which is half of, of the shift. And so uh, we can tell that indeed we have a, a, a chiral interaction between these two layers. This is again then reflected in, in microspin simulations. So, uh, then the next obvious thing to do is to investigate the thickness dependence, similar to what is done for RKKY coupling. And so here we plot on the left, the effective DMI field acting on terbium iron, the outer plane layer, and here the effective DMI field acting on the uh, cobalt layer, the top layer, with in-plane magnetization. And we see that both decrease strongly with the increasing platinum uh, thickness. Uh, we believe that these oscillations that we see here are not really the ones expected from the oscillatory behavior of uh, the uh, three spin model of the uh, DMI interaction, but rather induced by changes in the magnetic properties of our layers. Uh, we see them only also in the out of plane layer measurements. But uh, I think what is relevant here is that really we have uh, a strong um, coupling field at low thickness, and a, uh, this coupling field reduces as uh, the platinum thickness is um, increased, which is also uh, expected, I would say, for this system. Right. Uh, I remind you that the interactions that we're looking at are different from proximity effects, which might be present, but this is not what is uh, measured in this case. Uh, what is interesting is also to compare the uh, energy, the coupling energy, which can be just calculated by multiplying the field uh, times the, um, the uh, magnetic magnetization and saturation of the top or bottom layer times their thickness. And this gives us for, for our, uh, in our case, uh, this DMI energies that are the order of 40 microjoule per meter square. And so this is uh, smaller than what is uh, measured for the uh, strong RKKY coupling systems, but it's still a considerable coupling energy. So to conclude on this part of interlayer DMI coupling, we have uh, evidence that there is indeed strong indirect uh, chiral coupling mediated by a single platinum spacer. This is observed when the uh, two layers have orthogonal magnetization. And we can also separately determine 
the effective field acting on one or the other layer using anomalous hole effect leading to resistance in this geometry. We find this near monotonic dependence on platinum space of thickness. And something that I didn't show is that this coupling is uh, about a factor 10 stronger in platinum compared to uh, actually maybe more of like factor five between platinum and tantalum. Uh, and then there is another factor five or 10 between uh, ruthenium and titanium. So that's, uh, I think we still haven't explored all the things one can do using these couplings, but it's very promising for, for the future. Now, in, in the remaining time, I'd like to expand on the coupling induced by the DMI to treat systems that are uh, magnetic systems that uh, are on the same plane, so more like intralayer DMI coupling. And the point here is that uh, the couplings that occur between magnetic elements that uh, share a common plane uh, are generally of dipolar nature. Right? And so these couplings have been used, for example, to, to build, fabricate artificial spin ices, to also uh, uh, generate coupled response in uh, collections of, of uh, nanomagnets, like for example, this, this uh, magnetic dot cellular automata or this uh, majority logic gates that have been explored in the past. But dipolar coupling scales with the volume of the magnetic elements is not that strong, uh, is uh, non-local. So uh, we might want to have other types of couplings to um, you know, combine the magnetic response of uh, nanomagnets on the same plane. Now, we all know that uh, the jaluzinski moria interaction uh, is a, a phenomenon that takes place at interfaces and uh, that it is responsible, for example, for uh, inducing the formation of non-collinear magnetic textures. Um, and the main walls are one of these. And so um, we know that in systems for, with perpendicular magnetization, the DMI promotes the, the formation of nail type domain walls with a specific chirality. This has been observed already long time ago by spin polarized STM in a group of Isendanger. It has been then later interpreted as being due to the interfacial DMI. And it is now known that uh, this, the fact that the interfacial DMI promotes nail domain walls instead of block walls in, in this uh, very thin uh, layer systems with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy is very useful for uh, inducing the main wall motion using uh, spin orbit torque, so current injection. Mm -hmm. And also the, these domain walls can then uh, not only be uh, controlled in terms of chirality, nail versus block, but also position at different uh, locations by patterning the anisotropy of a magnetic layer, for example, by ion irradiation. Okay, so um, now here, again, we, we go back to the three-side model of Larry and Fert, uh, and we have our model system is, a, is an ultra-thin cobalted layer with PMA uh, on a platinum substrate. We know that here the DMI interaction promotes nailed main walls with you know, this kind of left chirality. And the idea is that we can exploit this uh, interfacial interaction to uh, couple together uh, a out of plane magnet in an in plane. Magnet. So, essentially, to achieve something like this, we have a continuous layer where we pattern out of plane magnetic anisotropy on one region and in plane anisotropy on the other. And the DMI will favor a certain coupling between the two, these two regions through this uh, sort of half domain wall. And so this is possible. There are several ways to, uh, in which one can uh, pattern the magnetic anisotropy of, of, uh, of thin magnetic layers, either by selective oxidation, iron irradiation, or electric gating. Here we use selective oxidation of uh, an aluminum cup layer on top of cobalt and platinum. 
And so if we cover with a tantalum mask, cover layer, and we oxidize the system, we achieve uh, PMA on the unmasked part of the film. This works very, very well, as you see in this uh, uh, wire, where we have half of the system is, is in plane magnetization. This is a longitudinal mock uh, image, and this is a polar mock image showing an out of plane magnetization. Good. So if we do that, and then with uh, for for small islands of platinum cobalt um, that are partially covered by this uh, oxidation mask, so we see that we have um, in the uh, regions that are oxidized we have out of plane magnetization. In the regions that are uh, not oxidized we have in plane magnetization, and the relative orientation between the in plane and out of plane magnetization is actually chiral. It follows the what is expected uh, from the chirality of the domain walls in cobalt plat. These are uh, X-ray photoelectron microscopy images with magnetic contrast of the cobalt image. So indeed, this coupling uh, occurs, and it is uh, strong enough, even if it only occurs at the interface between these two sections of this island, to induce uh, exchange bias. So we have a sort of a lateral exchange bias that can be seen in this uh, anomalous hole resistance traces that measure the magnetization of this out-of-plane region. Uh, and we see that uh, the out-of-plane loop is shifted depending on the in-plane orientation of the uh, magnetic, of the uh, in-plane magnetic part of the system. Uh, we can also exploit this coupling as a symmetry breaking effect to favor current induced magnetic switching by spin orbit torques in the absence of any applied field. So we can switch from up to down and the outer plane part of the island uh, without uh, applying an in-plane field because we have uh, this uh, in-plane magnetic layer that couples to the outer plane. And uh, by then uh, patterning a second out of plane island on the other side of the in plane spacer here, we can achieve uh, an antiferromagnetically out of plane coupled system. Right? So we have antiferromagnetic interaction mediated by the in plane spacer. And uh, this works until the, this in plane spacer is single domain. And uh, so for in plane spacers shorter than about 300 nanometers, we can really. Uh, switch the magnetic orientation of one side and then observe the switching also on the other side. Uh, and this is induced by the switching of the in-plane layer in the middle. So we can exploit this interaction also to build synthetic two-dimensional antiferromagnetic structures. And uh, even if there is no direct coupling between the two ends of this uh, uh, chain type of structure here, it is still true that the in-plane orientation in this system will determine the preferred orientation for these uh, two out-of-plane islands. And so we can also change the shape of this in-plane spacer and still uh, have a sort of a biased uh, behavior for, for these systems. We can then also build more complex systems like this artificial skirmions and skirmioniums uh, that are made of concentric regions with uh, uh, out-of-plane magnetization in red and, and tiny in-plane spacer regions in blue here. And we can repeat this process uh, many times. We can change the geometry and so, uh, for example, fabricate uh, square lattices of antiferromagnetically coupled out of plane regions coupled by this, this in plane magnetized lines. We can construct uh, systems with frustration, frustrated interactions. These are very interesting for uh, studying uh, artificial spin eye systems, as it is done, you know, for example, by Eduardo Feiderman and colleagues. Now, an interesting uh, point here is that also we can exploit not only the DMI in the systems, but also the fact that we have strong spin orbit torques 
uh, when we inject the current in platinum and cobalt. And in particular, the damping like torque that results from spin hole effect and other the facial uh, charge spin conversion effects has a strong effect on the uh, on a domain wall because it acts as an easy axis field and basically induces the motion of a domain wall with a very high mobility. And so we can combine this current induced domain wall motion promoted by spin orbit torques with this coupled uh, systems on a, on a magnetic racetrack. This is what we did in this experiment where we investigated current induced domain wall motion in a racetrack where we have two uh, out of plane regions separated by an in plane space. So this is a region with in plane magnetic anisotropy. And then we induce current, uh, so we induce uh, domain wall motion by current pulses in this system. And so uh, we look at what happens when a, a, a domain wall approaches the in plane magnetized region. And it's very interesting to notice that what happens is actually an inversion of the domain. And so that means that the polarity of the domain wall, here you see uh, in up down domain walls, uh, transforms into its opposite. Here it's down up. This is verified by uh, scanning transmission X ray microscopy experiments that show such a domain wall approaching in the in plane spacer and emerging on the other side as uh, with. Uh, opposite contrast. Okay. This, uh, we've verified this many times. It's a very robust effect, which is induced by the uh, combination of several torques or effective fields. On the one hand, we have the spin orbit torque that is pushing a domain wall against the in plane region. Uh, and as the domain wall is squeezed against the in plane region, then we have a strong dipolar field appearing due to the magnetic charges at the main wall boundaries that uh, favors the annihilation of this um, the main wall together with the DMI. And on the other hand, uh, on the other side, the, both the torques as well as the DMI favor the nucleation and then the propagation of the main wall with reversed polarity. And this uh, is very effective. It's actually even more effective when we structure the in-plane region as a V because that favors the nucleation of, a, uh, of the domain wall on the opposite side uh, um, in this uh, point-like uh, structures. And we can see that we can indeed invert uh, domain walls also one after the other. So here we have a train of uh, domain walls Right, we have one here, one there, it's up, down, up. And uh, as we pulse the current, this, uh, the main walls emerge as down, up, down on the other side. We can also cascade more of these um, in-plane regions, one after the other. And so what we are actually doing is we are cascading domain wall inverters, right? So we call this knot gates. In, in, uh, with respect to domain walls. We can also structure these inverters uh, in a way such that they become asymmetric. So we can have a situation where a positive current favors the propagation of the domain wall here from left to right, as you see before and after current pulses, but the opposite current uh, will not manage to uh, move the domain walls behind uh, this structure. Here. So this works effectively as a uh, domain wall diode. So you see here, you see here we have zero velocity for one current direction and non-zero velocity for the other. We can then combine uh, more domain wall racetracks into uh, 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 this type of junctions. And what we're actually doing here is building a uh, type of uh, majority or actually minority uh, gates where we have uh, two inputs and what we call a bias. This is essentially a third input that we keep fixed in order to define the functionality of the gate. And then we have an in-plane region separating these different uh, 
out of plane raised tracks. And what you see here in, in yellow, this is the platinum current line underneath. So what happens here is that if we have all the three inputs pointing up, the um, antiferromagnetic coupling mediated by the DMI through this in-plane spacer will favor an output that is pointing down. And this uh, uh, also is the case if we have only two inputs pointing up and one pointing down. But if we have a larger number of inputs pointing down, then we will have an output that will point up. And so this is essentially the behavior of a, of a NAND or a NOR gate, depending on the polarity of the bias terminal that we can preset here by applying an external field. So here, just to explain, the, the, uh, the inputs are preset by applying a field, and then the, the uh, logic operation is performed by sending current pulses through the platinum line. Okay. Uh, we have done also experiments that show that we can achieve not only this logic operations, but also crossover of domain walls over uh, this type of intersections. We have switching and fan out, these are well known for, for the main wall propagations. Okay. So we have essentially a complete set of logic elements and we can build more complex logic uh, gates like this uh, multiplexers or uh, this uh, half subtractor or a full adder gate. So that's very interesting in terms of uh, manipulating information that is uh, encoded in the polarity of the magnetization in the racetrack and uh, not only storing the information but also performing logic operations with them all using electrical currents. Now there's more work to be done. One is integrating this type of racetracks with all electrical inputs and output uh, elements and uh, there are also uh, some issues, uh, essentially material issues related to, to scaling. For example, if you want to, to reduce the dimensions of this case, uh, shrinking the, the racetracks, then we might have additional pinning issues with domain wall speed and also synchronization issues. And then one thing that uh, uh, cannot be realized with this system so far is uh, a simple uh, magnetic feedback loop. Anyway, I think this are very interesting directions of research. And so I'll come to an end and uh, conclude saying that the jalousinski mori interaction is strong enough to couple also two layers separated by a non-magnetic spacer, in particular if this non-magnetic spacer is platinum. There might be materials with stronger spacing, but uh, so far this is the largest we have found. Uh, this type of interlayer coupling can be used to stabilize chiral magnetic states to favor asymmetric switching, and it might find applications in uh, multi-layer devices. On the other hand, the DMI is also very promising to couple uh, magnets uh, that lie on the same plane, and here we've seen examples of what can be done in this laterally coupled structures, ranging from lateral exchange bias to synthetic uh, antiferromagnetic structures uh, to feel free SLT switching the main wall injection and inversion in current domain wall logic. So with that I uh, finish my talk and I look forward to receiving your comments in some form. Bye bye.